October 20th, 20th, not October 22nd. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right, I have a motion to approve the uh, open session minutes of October 20th, 2014 as amended. Make a motion to approve the open session minutes of October 20th, 2014 as amended. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Next, community comments. All right, hearing none. Uh, I'm going to pass student comments as well. Since Chris is not present, if he appears, we'll let him say his piece <coughs> when he comes. Um, okay, so next item on the agenda is Superintendent Lewis comments for this evening. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the first uh, item that I have is just a, a status update of where we are within the Schuylkill uh, water situation. Um, as I communicated to the committee, and I also communicated to all of our MISCO parents, uh, bless you, uh, we received word uh, just about two weeks ago now that um, based upon regular testing that the DEP does of our well, that there were four consecutive tests where we had elevated levels of manganese manganese being a, a trace element. It's actually a transitional metal. Um, and um, the, the levels were elevated ever so slightly. Uh, keep in mind that the uh, permissible level is 0 0.30 milligrams per liter in a sample. And we've averaged over our last four samples 0 0.31. So literally a hundredth of a milligram uh, per liter over. Uh, nonetheless, it is something that we have to address. Um, keep in mind, too, this is considered, and this kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but it's a minor contaminant. It's not considered to be something that's very, very significant, like you know, elevated perchlorate levels or, or something of that nature. Um, and the health risks uh, in the guidance documents that we've received from DEP seem to be uh, the, the largest health risks would be at, for infants and using that type of water for um, formula. So, um, but in an abundance of caution, what we've done is we've set up pool and spring coolers, 15 of them all throughout uh, the halls at MISCO, wherever there was a bubbler. We've uh, put in a pool and spring cooler. We've also put them in the cafeteria. Um, we're anticipating to address this within the next 60 days or so. Uh, we're working with a firm out of Marlboro, Comprehensive Environmental, um, and they are going to do the engineering plans for what in all likelihood will be a filtration system uh, to deal with this system. So as soon as we uh, get more information in what we're looking at and the potential costs, it could be, as I said, something in the fifteen to $20,000 range to address this. And we're going based upon what we use now 
as far as the filtration system for our well at Clough. Um, but we should have a handle on that by the, the holidays. And I, I'm told by Ken Chuanier the majority of our work is really the engineering plans. Once they have the plans in place, the actual installation of the system shouldn't be too long. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, the second thing is uh, a piece of good news. Last Thursday evening, the Menden CPC uh, unanimous, uh, unanimously uh, voted to match the $1,000 uh, funding that the Upton CPC gave for uh, the turf field feasibility study at NITMA. Um, so uh, within the next 24 hours, I should be signing the proposal from Gale Associates so that you can get the ball rolling on that. And we're anticipating having the results of that feasibility study hopefully right around the first of the year. Okay. Um, another piece of very, very good news that we got this past <coughs> week is the district did receive a $5,000 grant from the Music Drives Us Foundation. Um, it's a foundation that was formed by Ernie Bach Jr. and every once in a blue moon you might see their commercials on <laughs> TV. Not that Ernie Bach Jr. isn't into promotion. Um, but it, it really is uh, a, a terrific foundation and um, the district received 5000 to buy essentially technology, things like IMAX, uh, a MIDI keyboard, noise canceling headphones, USB microphones for a new elective course at Network, uh, music composition and songwriting. So Jay really did a lot of the heavy lifting on uh, writing this grant. It, it kind of started with an idea of brainstorming between Jay and Mike Morrell and it's kind of carried over to Mike's uh, successor, Simon Harding. So kudos and congratulations uh, on a job well done, and it's a nice little extra piece of funding. Thanks. Um, third item, uh, just as kind of a, a check-in, I am reaching out to all stakeholders, uh, our teachers, our uh, administrative staff, our parents, probably accessing parents through our school councils to put together uh, an ad hoc committee to look at the school calendar. Um, if you recall, I think it was last January or February when we kind of got into the discussion slash debate about the 1415 calendar. I think it's really wise to get together a manageable group of folks, maybe 10 or 12, to look at the 1516 calendar. Hopefully to do this with a cool level head before <laughs> there's snow and ice. I think it might be a little bit late in that based upon this weekend. Um, but to look at it very level headed as far as you know, the discussion of the existing vacations, possibilities to gain days here and there. And then I think there was discussion about religious holidays and so on. Um, but my game plan would be to get that committee together within the next month or so to have uh, some discussion and then to have uh, the recommendations to the committee by the end of January for the 15-16 school calendar so you can approve it uh, by your February meeting. Okay? Is there anybody uh, of the four of you that's interested in serving on that committee? Shouldn't be... I would be interested. Okay. Shouldn't be that involved as, as far as to an involved number of meetings. Okay, and uh, last but not least, as I do every year, I'd like to briefly go over um, my annual plan as far as my evaluation. Like every uh, educator in the district, Um, I have to develop annual goals, uh, specifically student learning goals, professional practice goals, and then highlighted uh, district improvement goals. Perfect. So um, I believe two weeks ago, um, I met with the superintendent's evaluation subcommittee 
and uh, laid out what exactly the goals were as far as in these three areas. And uh, I bring it to the full committee tonight for approval. Um, if you recall, and this is applicable to me and every single educator, the, the, the state evaluation model is a five-step process starting with self-assessment. I've had the opportunity to share my self-assessment with the subcommittee. Uh, all of you have access to that. If you log on to TeachPoint, you can see what I've done as far as my self-assessment uh, and commentary in each of the four standards. Um, really, the second phase and the third phase is where we are now as far as setting some goals based upon the self-assessment and really what the district needs are. Uh, then actually the implementation of the educator plan throughout the school year. Uh, then really around that halfway point, maybe late January, early February, kind of reviewing where uh, you are with regard to your goals. And then the, at the end of uh, the cycle, the, the actual summative evaluation. So in looking at what uh, my goals are, first the student learning goal kind of mirrors what I did last year, where last year the focus was on grades three and four and some of the MCAS scores. This uh, kind of bumps it up to grades five and six and looking specifically at our MCAS results um, in both ELA and in math at grades five and six and looking at uh, the aggregate or all students performance but also our major uh, subgroup which is the high needs subgroup and if you recall high needs is a combination of students with disabilities uh, our English language learners and our students who receive free or reduced lunch um, realize in some cases we are meeting the targets there in other cases we are not meeting the targets but I think the, the smartest uh, piece to use as a metric is recall CPI, the comp uh, Composite Performance Index, which takes into the account the, the goal, the scores of every single kid in the grade. So specifically, um, under the state's accountability system, and specifically growing over a period of time, but also having uh, the proficiency gap between all students and our high need students, uh, the Department of Ed has given specific CPI targets for grade five and grade six. Essentially, the student learning goal is around achieving those exact targets. Okay. Second goal is a professional practice goal, and specifically, it's around highlighting our district's practices, but also accomplishments. As you can see by the stating of the goal, I will implement five new practices and structures that educate parents and community members on positive news regarding our district. So the question is, what are these five new practices? Um, first one is adding something to the school committee agenda. Um, I'd like to believe that we make our school committee uh, agendas substantive, but really deliberately focusing on uh, a teaching and learning initiative or a practice and really highlighting it uh, at least four times between now and April. That is something that I refer to as spotlight on teaching and learning. Um, Second one, which is by far the most ambitious one, and it's been a goal for at least the last two or three years, is to publish and to disseminate to every home and business in these two towns um, a district performance report. So this district report, performance report would detail how the district, how the four schools are doing on standard metrics like our tests and so on, but it would also have a narrative as to how well we're meeting our goals as outlined in our strategic plan, okay? Something that I think is important in detailing our district's successes and district's challenges and giving our parents and our community members more information about uh, the district. Uh, the third one is creating a district YouTube channel, something that has been done to live stream not only these meetings but also uh, events. 
Fourth, uh, appearances on local cable access shows to highlight district initiatives. I've had the opportunity uh, to go on Upton's Be My Guest. I uh, have plans on also doing the same thing I, uh, in Menden, but also, again, just highlighting some of our district accomplishments. And then also, uh, within the next month, we will be unveiling our new and updated uh, district website, and one of the things on the home page, front and center, will be a good news tab, kind of a, a frequent update of some of the positive things happening within the district. So these are three areas, uh, three things that you've seen before when you approve the uh, district improvement goals for this year, but I've highlighted three which will also go in my goal setting. Uh, for this school year is first the goal around technology integration, specifically implementing the one-to-one -one learning initiative at, at the high school, expanding it, and also ensuring that there's consistent use of smart boards at the, at, uh, that should read elementary level. Secondly, uh, the Common Core State Standards Alignment, again, continuing our work uh, around aligning our written curriculum to the Common Core State Standards, but also ensuring that teachers have uh, sufficient instructional materials um, that are aligned with the Common Core State Standards as evidenced by things like the implementation of the Wonders Literacy Series and the Empowering Writers uh, Writing Program. And third, uh, again, around communication and outreach is um, by the end of this year, this school year rather, we will have a comprehensive online presence that provides users with up-to-date district information. Uh, the specific steps around this goal detail the work that we're doing to update our website, but also to have a social media presence. So those really are the five goals that are the, uh, the crux of my educator plan. You should have a copy of the full plan with all the key action steps and the benchmarks uh, for each of those five goals. Again, as we have in the last two years, there's the timeline, uh, really looking at where we are na uh, now versus two of the benchmark times, the first one being that mid-cycle goal review. The vision is that the evaluation subcommittee will meet uh, before Groundhog Day, so probably late January, and uh, I will do a report out as far as where I am in the goals and specifically the key actions that are detailed. And um, the subcommittee chair will give a report to the full school committee at the February meeting on February 9th. And then what we will shoot for as far as the summative evaluation will be uh, that evaluation to be complete by the end of August and reported out at the September 7th school committee meeting. So that's it in a very quick nutshell. Does anybody have any specific questions about the plan? Yeah, I just have one quick question. As far as like uh, it was almost one part of it was like public, public relations. Mm -hmm. But we haven't thought about reaching out to the community and say, and see if we can volunteer in the time. And the reason I say that is BBT does a great job at promoting their good news all over the place. And they have a person over there, a paid staff member who does it. But I wonder if we could reach out to, I mean, there's you know, probably 15,000 people in these two towns. I'm sure somebody works in public relations. and. I think we could go with the volunteer. Realize, uh, Chris, this year we do have um, somebody kind of working in an ad hoc capacity uh, doing the communications piece. Um, and I would say probably 90% of our efforts now is in updating the, the website and migrating all of the content from the existing site. Uh, to the new platform. So, uh, yeah, I think we could volunteer for an extra set of hands, so to speak. I think it's also something that we could also consider 
as far as expanding that position when we consider the FY16 budget. I think that one of the things that we've got to be cognizant of is in managing a website, managing social media accounts, it's probably better to have fewer hands involved in it more than more hands. Um, next, we'll move on to subcommittee updates. And do you need a motion to approve that? You technically should. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, may I have a motion to approve the superintendent's annual plan as presented? Motion to approve the superintendent's plan, annual plan for 2014 and 15 as presented. A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So now we move on to so committee updates. Um, policy subcommittee um, is calling for the second reading and approval of two policies that were given first read at the last meeting, policy ADF, the district wellness policy, and revised policy IJNDD, the policy on social media and networking websites. Um, so starting with policy ADF, the district wellness policy, is there any further discussion or any, any other comments or um, agenda or clarification that's needed on this policy? Hearing none, I then request a motion that we approve policy ADF, the district wellness policy. Make a motion to approve the policy ADF, the district wellness policy. District wellness policy. So second. Second. Okay. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying no. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, and next we have the revised policy IJ and DD, the policy on social media and networking <coughs> websites. Um, and we had the policy, both policies were appended in our packets, and there has been a change, a slight change requested. Hi, Marta, Joe, did you want to explain? Yeah, it, uh, uh, a, a recommendation was made, and, and it, it's, it's semantics, but it's a little more than semantics. I think it's substantive. Um, but the, the, the change is under uh, posting items, uh, the formally read posting items exhibiting or advocating the use of alcohol or drugs has been broken up into two areas and, and now it reads three posting items promoting or advocating the use of alcohol and then four posting items exhibiting or advocating the use of drugs where um, <coughs> where they were mixed together that they've been separated out and, and the mindset goes like this I, I think everybody that works in the organization um, has to read and review this policy and sign off that they understand it. Um, and they'll comply with it, most importantly. Um, I think by making this change, uh, most of us who are social media users um, have pictures posted, Either they post them themselves, or oftentimes other people post pictures. You might be tagged in a picture and so on. So a hypothetical was brought up saying, well, what if somebody takes a picture of me at a family barbecue and I happen to have a beer or a glass of wine in my hands? Under the verbiage that it was, would that be a violation of the policy? So I think the, the, the recommended change where um, getting rid of the word exhibiting and changing it to promoting or advocating kind of gets to the spirit of this policy. And the spirit of this policy would be, as professionals, we are cognizant that we serve as role models. And, um, you know, I think with illicit drugs, that's <laughs> pretty much a, um, you know, a no-brainer. And that's pretty black and white. But with the whole issue of alcohol, um, the issue really is 
is it a picture where it's just a happenstance, or is it a picture where somebody is actively promoting or advocating uh, substance abuse? So I think this minor change in language kind of speaks to the spirit of the policy. Any further discussion? Okay, I have a motion to approve revised policy IJNDD, the policy on social media and networking websites. I make a motion that we have, uh, approve the amended policy IJNDD, policy on social media networking websites. That's presented. Second. Further discussion? Those in favor signify by saying no. Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's see, it's accepted. Um, next, we have old business. Is there any old business before the committee? Hearing none, we'll move on to new business. Um, the results of the one to one initiative currency. Okay. All right, back in uh, July, we sent out a survey to MISCO parents. Uh, based upon last year being the first full year of the one-to-one -one initiative. Um, so what I'd like to do, and it, it was a, a fairly straightforward survey, I think it was all of 13 or 14 questions. What I'd like to do is kind of give you a summary <coughs> and overview of uh, what the results were from that. So just so you know, uh, as far as some data, it was mailed out to about 630, 640 uh, parent emails through our Blackboard Connect, and we had a response rate uh, a little over a third, which really isn't that bad. Uh, and we kept it open for approximately a month. Okay. So as you can see, um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the uh, questions and kind of point out some of the more uh, salient data. Um, pretty much a, a, a consistent cross-section as far as parents of, uh, of students and the, the different grades. Um, so the first series of questions we're asking about really the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of why we have the, the one to one initiative. So the question being, how would you classify the value of the iPad enhancing your child's engagement and motivation? So as you can see, it's a, a really a, a five point Likert scale going from very important down to not important, but then also, I don't know, I'm unsure. Okay, so uh, the takeaway from this is about 74, 75%, so roughly three quarters of parents um, say that, that there is value in regard to uh, the iPad for enhancing engagement and motivation. Same type of question, uh, classify the value of um, enhancing collaboration and communication. A little bit higher. Uh, if you were to take those top three at least somewhat important, it comes up to be about 81%. So at least half say important or very important. Next one, uh, how would you classify the value of the iPad in keeping your child more organized with regard to the materials? Um, and then and again, that's coming out about 75% say it's at least somewhat important. This is the most positive uh, item. How would you classify the value of the iPad in enhancing innovative learning experiences? So again, if you track somewhat important, important, and very important, it comes out to be about 84% see the value in innovation. Um, next question, how has your student benefited from working in a one-to-one -one learning environment? Um, by far the largest, uh, over 70% like services like IXL or Discovery Education and so on. So various apps or sites that were used to kind of reinforce what was being done by the classroom teacher. 68% uh, said that they liked the use of the iPad for multimedia. And uh, about 55% like the whole e-textbook notion as well. 
So uh, then we wanted to know some questions about technical issues. Okay, how frequently was your child having some type of technical issues? Our largest response was hardly ever. Okay, that came out to be about 55%. And uh, the second was occasionally, which was 25%. So by and large, we didn't find that there was a lot of tech issues. When there were tech issues, where were the kids receiving uh, assistance? Uh, the number one response was at school from the help desk system. And seeing that we really didn't get that up and running until relatively late in the school year, um, that you know, I, I, I see that as a success. Um, if you were to break this down, uh, by and large, when kids received help, they received help on their iPad from uh, um, school. If you were to combine at school from help desk system and at school from the teachers, it comes out to be roughly 60% of help. And then question nine, uh, how much screen time does your child accumulate daily for school-related activities? I find this to be a very uh, interesting question. 60% um, of our parents um, said it was two hours or less, which is kind of interesting. And then when you juxtapose that with how much screen time does your child accumulate daily for personal interests and in activities, uh, it's a greater percentage, 70% we're at two hours or less. I think if we have a next step, and actually this can be done on SurveyMonkey, would be to disaggregate this data, breaking it down by um, the, the, the four-hour people, the three, four-hour people, the two, three-hour people, and seeing <coughs> what preferences did they have, what did they see as far as the value of the iPad, as far as different applications and so on. Then um, question 11, which kind of dovetails with this, is do you have difficulty in monitoring your child's use of time on his or her iPad? So this is a question I would really love to cross-reference with the previous questions. Because, you know, is this a situation where we have somebody on an iPad for four hours a day? Or is it less than that? Um, our greatest response was, this is a minor problem, um, but roughly 20%, I think it came out to be 21%, said this is a big problem. So I think kind of teasing it out to, is this a school-related problem? Is this a lots of personal use um, problem? We, re we really needed to tease this out. I do think it's interesting, and again, the next question builds across that, is the school has been clear in its expectations on how much the iPad online application should be used at home. Okay, So as you can see, we're kind of across the board here. Um, if you were to take the disagree and strongly disagree, it's about 30%, so roughly one-third. But then when you dubbed, uh, combine that with no opinion or they're not sure, it comes out to be about 60% of our parents. So I think a, a quick takeaway from this is we probably need to do more in detailing exactly what our expectations are uh, with our parents and, and kind of spelling it out by subject, by grade, and so on, how much the kids should be on the iPad. I know with my own uh, daughters, and you know, my youngest is in ninth grade, and she's in a high school that has a one-to-one -one initiative. It's very, very easy. You know, she's on her Chromebook, and yes, she's working on a document on Google Drive, but she's also on the internet simultaneously. She's also on Instagram and so on. I mean, I think it's that way with adults as well. It's very easy to become distracted. So. Spelling that out for our parents, I think, is, is a key moving forward with this initiative. Um, the last three questions were uh, fill in the text box. So we had responses of 
you know, this particular question, 157 respondents, they were all over the place. But what I tried to capture in this were the really the, the, the top six or seven responses in a category. So the question is, what do you see as the greatest benefits of the iPad this past year in your child's learning? Number one response was being able anytime, anywhere to access all types of resources, all types of information that they would need in their classes. Uh, a lot of kudos to the MISCO staff as far as uh, teachers communicating with uh, their students, it being very quick, very prompt. Um, a lot of kudos and commentary about uh, students and parents being able to find out homework and extra help with assignments and so on. So those were some real strong takeaways. Uh, also some strong takeaways as far as emerging with e-textbooks and also some of the collaboration pieces as well, various apps that we're using. So what I tried to capture here um, were some of the selected responses. Obviously, you know, if, if any of you as a committee want to see, read all 157, I'd be more than happy uh, to share those with you. Um, but you can see some of, the, some of the comments about easier to communicate, particularly if my student was absent. Uh, a lot of uh, parents, particularly parents of fifth graders, talked about it being such a great tool to help their child become better organized. That came up quite a, uh, again and again. Um, again, the organization piece, the collaboration piece, um, having study aids online, um, again, came up time and again. So the second text response was uh, starting in 1415, the district will offer parent technology nights. In, which, in what areas would you like to see the district offer support to parents? By and large, uh, a lot of responses of, can you give us a general overview? Or, you know, my child assumes that I know how various apps work, you know, even something like uh, Notability, which is a note-taking app. And there was commentary like, I'm completely clueless. I don't know how that works. I'm of no assistance to them. So that came up uh, quite a bit. Um, also commentary on wanting more information, more potential tools that they could use in the home for monitoring or possibly filtering uh, content. Okay, a, a lot of people in the home, they may have <coughs> Wi-Fi, but there's no restrictions or controls on the Wi-Fi like there is here within all the schools. So getting some more information about that. Um, there was commentary um, around, some pieces around, can you give us a little additional help uh, in technical support, you know, for garden variety repairs that might be done, and so on. There was also a kind of in that same milieu as far as internet safety, some folks did specifically mention about social media and knowing what apps are out there, social media and what their kids may be getting into. So again, some commentary. Uh, I apologize for some of those smaller uh, uh, font sizes, but kind of captures, um, please help us out. You know, my, my child assumes I know what these apps are for, but I really don't. I want a, you know, a general overview of the program and so on. I think that bottom one, anything iPad dummy here, we saw that a couple times here and there. And then last but not least, what suggestions do you have to improve uh, the one-to-one -one learning initiative? So um, again, responses all over the place, um, but if I had to categorize them, first one was use the e-textbooks more and make a more of a concerted effort to go paperless, okay? Um, I think that's understandable, and, and, and again, I've thanked him publicly, but I can't thank him enough publicly, is Anthony Amitrano, who really um, has spearheaded 
so much of the detail-oriented work at MISCO with this. And one of the big things that has very much been a frustration has been dealing with Pearson, who has been our e-text provider. So there's been a lot of glitches, and last year was the first year. Um, I think we had more success this year. Nonetheless, there still are glitches. Um, somebody should get a saddle for that fly. <laughs> so large. He's hanging tough, though, November 3rd. Anyway, I digress. Um, but uh, there was a lot of commentary about e-textbooks. Um, I thought it was interesting. Second one, please give us more information about the program. We support it, but we need to know more. Again, uh, the whole line uh, around more controls, more restrictions. It didn't make the top seven or eight, but we also had folks say the converse, that they felt like at MISCO there were too many restrictions, and particularly for a parent finance model, they should have more freedom and more latitude, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, consistency, consistency in usage in various content areas and in various classrooms, but also consistency in apps, particularly in the homework uh, related sites and apps. Um, instructional balance. Some folks said, okay, iPads are great, but they kids shouldn't be doing everything on iPads. You know, there's traditional pen, paper, writing, kids need those skills. Kids need to hold a book as well. Not everything can be the iPad. And I'm very, very comfortable, uh, confident that there certainly is a cognition of that uh, within the district. Um, some folks talked about the, the cost involved, uh, what can the district do to move in a direction where it's financed um, by the district rather than the parents financing this. Um, and then some folks also talked about additional tech support. So again, uh, some selected, I, again, I just picked out four that kind of captured some of this. People talking about, again, that commitment to going paperless, uh, to reduce school supplies, to reduce binders, and so on. Um, consistency of teachers using it and using uh, consistent homework apps. Um, that last piece, clearer information as far as how it's being used. And then, um, as you can see, that bottom right quote about making sure that there's balance with regard to you know, traditional means of instruction along with uh, the iPad. So as far as, I, and I think some of these I've touched upon as far as takeaways and our next steps, um, I think by and large for first year of implementation, by and large there's mostly positive opinions um, and they see the value of the program. A uh, lot of uh, positive feelings, as I said before, uh, around the value of it as far as helping our kids with organization and also reinforcing uh, the content and the skills that are being done in the classroom. A um, lot of kudos, as I said, to uh, the Misco Hill teachers as far as enhanced communication uh, due to the initiative. And uh, with that, the recommendation for a greater degree of consistency in the usage and the various apps that are being used uh, school-wide. Um, it did come up as far as the issue of screen time, and I think this is something that we need to explore, and this is a conversation and a dialogue that we need to have with our, with our parents. And I think thinking about how clear we are going to be with our expectations and communicating them to our parents is key here as far as how frequently should students be on the iPads when at home. And um, also the piece around monitoring and filtering and what are some apps that are out there, what are some solutions for our parents that are looking into this. So I think our next step based upon the feedback would be, um, and it is part of our district goals to do um, I believe three or four parent information nights, and this would be for both Misco Hill, but also Nipmuc uh, parents, 
Um, and the first one, again, a general overview and, and, for lack of a better term, App 101 night to kind of give an overview. These are the goals of the program, but these are also some of the basic apps that you're going to see both at Visco Hill and at the high school and giving our parents some of the insight. So I think those are some of the basic takeaways. Um, again, work this school year. I think that would be a huge help because um, talking about the whole communication piece, especially if you've got multiple children at the school or at two different schools, always having that one interface that you're familiar with, you're, you're comfortable with, that you can a, a teacher can easily disseminate, disseminate information to parents and you can be doing a check-in because I too have the same problem as you, Chris. It's like if my son comes home with paper and pencil homework, I don't have any issues with them accomplishing it, but as soon as they come home with iPad homework, that's when my, my issues arise and I too 